It's time once again for Dialogue Conspiracy with Mae Brussel. For the past 14 years, Mae has been researching and uncovering facts and evidence from between the lines of the news and placing them in a more thorough perspective of how conspiracy, political assassination, and abuses of power affect us all. Dialogue Conspiracy originates with KLRB-FM in Carmel, California. And now, Mae Brussel. Good evening. This is Mae Brussel. It's October the 9th, 1977, and we're doing program number 290 And Dialogue Conspiracy. Uh, most of the program will consist of a critique of that ABC television program that I started on last week because what I say is applying to the a two-part story of Lee Harvey Oswald, the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald, can also be applied to the CBS production coming up called Ruby and Oswald. So that if you take the notes that I give on this program or the tape cassettes, the people that have the tape cassettes, you can play them over after the CBS show in November because the same faults will be with the CBS show that are on the ABC this month. Before I get into that, I do want to mention a movie that's playing here in Carmel for local listeners or for others uh, in their cities where they get the tapes. Be sure to see The Lincoln Conspiracy. I saw the movie. I didn't know what to expect, but I felt that I should see it because I have been studying as many of these political assassinations as I can. And I bought the book. It's by David Balsiger and Charles Sellier, Jr. See the movie. Buy the book. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Call sh talk shows and uh, tell people about this movie. It's an excellent movie. There are parallels between the Lincoln assassination and the John Kennedy assassination, more than I ever really studied. I have some very good books on the Lincoln assassination, but there's some new documents that have come out that have put uh, books like Mask for Treason into their perspective, new diaries and declassified documents. Of the, as I say, the parallels between Lincoln's murder and Kennedy's murder are there, and they're very clear, and they're clear enough for a high school student uh, to see and understand, and college student. And once you see the framework of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, as told through the book and through the references, it's cross-referenced, and the sources of information are available, and through the movie, then it's easier to understand the continuation of the political assassinations in America and the parallels before, between the Kennedy assassination. Uh, one of the new points that has come out through uh, a diary that was put away for a hundred years and then released was the fact that John Wilkes Booth was not murdered, that the gentleman that was killed in the barn that evening that was shot was a Mr. Boyd and that Abraham Lincoln's assassin was allowed to leave the country with the help of William Seward, the Secretary of State, and Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War. Uh, their jobs are comparable to John Foster Dulles and his brother Alan Dulles, John Foster was Secretary of State uh, prior to Kennedy's administration, and Alan Dulles was head of the CIA when John Kennedy was president and then uh, was fired by John Kennedy because he didn't trust the CIA after the Bay of Pigs invasion and was put back in the Warren Commission. Uh, this story uh, goes into the fact of the man that was killed, who was supposed to be John Wilkes Booth, had a red beard, whereas John Wilkes Booth had shaved his beard and that the body had been dumped, taken to a Navy yard and dumped, and the people in power knew that it wasn't John Wilkes Booth, and this is clear in the movie and new documents. And, of course, I believe I'm the only researcher in the John Kennedy assassination who has publicly stated on nationwide uh, radio and on KLRB that I don't believe that Lee Harvey Oswald was killed. I believe the double was killed, and I believe that the Lee Harvey Oswald that we know, the one that went to the Soviet Union, and then back to the Dallas-Fort Worth area, was taken to Baton Rouge. That's the information I have. And then to Brazil. And someday uh, he may surface, just like John Wilkes Booth was supposed to have surfaced later and said he was Booth. I refer to um, that statement uh, by reading to you pages from the Warren Commission meeting January 21st, 1964. That was just the first month or weeks that the Warren Commission was getting together and I've read this before on the air, but I think you can apply it to this movie, and I'll repeat it for those of you who don't know it. These are the minutes of the meetings when Earl Warren said we have to go to item H under Roman numeral 2, the remains of Lee Harvey Oswald. He said this man is buried in a cemetery. It takes officers around the clock to watch him and see that they don't come in and exhume him and do something that would further injure the country. Uh, we can't have him exhumed. We have to cremate him. 
Earl Warren went on to say the question would arise before this thing as to something on the body. I don't know what it is. It could be the course of the bullet. It might be something else. I don't think we would want that disposed of until our report is made. And then he gave orders for that body to be cremated. John J. McCloy was at the meeting, and so was Representative Hale Boggs. All the members of the Warren Commission were at that meeting. And Hale Boggs said, I'm concerned about moving him. You remember, it's funny how history repeats itself. All but the controversy, but all the controversy about the body ultimately went in the Lincoln story. And Earl Warren said, Lincoln? And Senator Russell says, not only that, but John Wilkes Booth. The people swore at the last that wasn't Booth they killed down there in the barn in Virginia. You remember the Navy put his body down there in the Navy Yard, and people kept claiming that they were John Wilkes Booth all over the United States. And Mr. McCloy, chairman of the Chase Manhattan Bank, a member of the Rockefeller legal staff, who then uh, was on the Warren Commission, said, it's the most dramatic thing you ever read. I went in the de War Department when they opened up and found these records. This is John J. McCloy saying in 1964. It's the most dramatic thing. It tells how they took him with a lantern in some fort down there and dumped him in the water. I think it was. And Senator Russell said, did they put a round of shots around him? Um, that just came out a few years ago. And McCloy said, that just saw the light of day a few years ago. Mr. Simpson and I looked at it when it was opened up. And McCloy went on, I don't think we should have this on the record that we are moving into this thing, meaning cremating the body down in Texas. We're not saying anything about it. And then they went on to advise that they would tell the U.S. Department of Justice to tell the authorities what to do with the body, get rid of it, and cremate it. That decision was made by the members of the Warren Commission, identical to the thieves and traitors around Abraham Lincoln uh, years earlier, and they made haste to dispose of this body. I noticed this week in the news, Associated Press, that Warren Commission member Hale Boggs um, had a mountain named after him. He fell out of an airplane over Juneau, Alaska a few years ago, and they were just going to name two mountain peaks in honor of him and Nick Bedgett, who disappeared. That was five years ago. Uh, Hale Boggs knew a lot, and he knew a lot at the time of the Watergate arrests, but Hale Boggs was flown over Alaska, and a pilot who flew him and changed the license on the planes and claims that he was responsible or part of this theory is now living in Australia. Well, I will go into the ABC uh, in one moment. There's one other matter I do want to bring up with you because from time to time on Dialogue Conspiracy, I share some of the events that happen in my own personal life, and uh, sometimes I avoid them, but once in a while they upset me, and this week was a really hard week. I was supposed to leave tomorrow morning to go up to Canada to work with a gentleman. All of you would know his name if I said on the air. Uh, he's well known. And I, for the first time, had access to some important documents. It probably was the most important trip I would have made in regards to my year's research. Outside of the trip, I meant to, made to see Jim Garrison, the district attorney in New Orleans, in 1967. That's when there was that bomb scare on our plane, and they kept my research and luggage and then flew it out on a special plane a few days later. Uh, that bomb scare and what happened to me on that Delta Airlines is incidentally is written up in my FBI Freedom of Information Act. Well, I was supposed to go to Canada tomorrow and stay up there for a week or two and work with a party, look at some documents. And Wednesday we were checking on the plans, and then by Wednesday afternoon the trip was over. This person's 21-year-old son was in an accident. His fourth, 12th vertebrae was broken, and they weren't sure whether he would be paralyzed or able to move again. Uh, this struck close to home. We've had uh, broken backs and accidents, one fatal in our family. Last September in 1976, I was working with uh, Don Stein. We were writing a book on Howard Hughes, and we were doing an article linking a reporter, Don Bowles, who was killed in Arizona, to the Hughes Pan American Mine Swindle and Emprise, the organization named by Bowles before he died. Uh, Don had an accident, of course, all coincidental, you know, uh, just coincidental, and he had two brain surgeries and was left legally blind and is now back at school. I know that accidents happen. This is what I've told by everybody, but I doubt if anyone I know has had as many accidents around them, as close to them as I have had since I've done the research in the last uh, six or seven or ten years, uh, the things that have happened around us. Also, Ted Gandolfo in New York City started his own TV show I mentioned on Dialogue Conspiracy on cable TV 
Friday nights at 7.30, and he got a phone call the same afternoon of this accident uh, up in Canada. He received a phone call in New York, again, unrelated, of course, just coincidental, and he was told if he did any more television shows, he'd never come out alive. Uh, Ted went to this television station Friday night. He wasn't killed, but he was armed, and it's a pathetic thing to think that the researchers either have to have bodyguards or be armed with weapons when they go to expose these conspiracies. I also know that uh, the movie I talked about on June 27th, Dialogue Conspiracy Number 275, I talked about the used mystery, the movie that I made the opening and closing of in five inserts. It's a million and a half dollar production with Broderick Crawford, Hope Holiday, and Cameron Mitchell. One third of the film is missing. The sections that I did about Clarence Kelly and the burial in Houston, Texas of Vance Cooper the scenes have been shelved. The movie, as far as I know, will never be produced. Uh, it's sitting in limbo. I spoke to the writer this week, and he doubts that the movie will ever be shown. Paul Krasner did an interview with me last March for WE magazine. Uh, Terry Ketchpel won an interview for WE that's owned by Hugh Hefner. I was paid $500, and Paul was given $700 for the interview. Um, the uh, article was accepted, and they were about to print it. And for some reason or other, that article was shelved, and I don't think that We Magazine will ever be allowed to print the interview. At the time uh, that we were doing this, was March 3rd and 4th, I was uh, stressing the importance of a gentleman main, named George de Mornschild to the John Kennedy assassination. Uh, George de Mornschild was killed March 29th, and I don't think the powers that be want that article out. There's some more pressure in Washington, D.C., for the House Select Committee to shelve their report on the uh, Kennedy assassination. Uh, Jim Garrison has told Ted Gandolfo that he feels he'll be completely vindicated for his arrest of Clay Shaw and the allegations of the conspiracy that took place in uh, the New Orleans part of the Kennedy assassination. But Mark Lane told Ted Gandolfo this week that he thinks there are pressures put upon Congress to shelve the investigation of the John Kennedy assassination, that they now have enough evidence to show that the CIA was involved in the killing of John Kennedy. And that would refute all these new books and movies coming out of cover stories uh, that the Russians were involved or the Cubans were involved. And it seems that there's a lot of pressure to stop this House committee. I'm sure a lot of the pressure is going to come from CIA Director Richard Helms. Uh, he's threatening that if he's charged with perjury, and Jimmy Carter has to decide whether or not to go through with those charges soon, that he will show that every previous CIA director lied to Congress. And I'm sure one of them will be Alan Dulles when he lied about Lee Harvey Oswald and the role of Oslo. Well, ABC, we'll get on to this now, uh, talking about ABC broadcast and the CBS onslaught that are coming. And the important thing about the broadcast, that the two-part serial, the trial, Lee Harvey Oswald, is that several years ago, if this was put on by a major uh, broadcasting station, they would get accolades from their CIA writers in the newspapers saying, this is wonderful, this is definitive, this should put the researchers to rest. But we're a little farther along the line now where the major media in the newspapers, as bad as they are, did not go for the movie of Lee Harvey Oswald. I have an article here from the Washington Post by Tom Shales. It's called The Tasteless Trial of Oswald. And this is... a. a article which just came out, and I want to read you a few excerpts to show what the Washington Post is saying about a national television show. He said, people used to worry that television desensitized us to violence. Now the big concern is it is desensitizing us to truth. It plays such dangerous games with fact and fancy that it blurs the distinction between the two. The trial of Lee Harvey Oswald is beyond question, tasteless and reprehensible. As a piece of entertainment, it goes with, as a, without question of being bad, he says, but it plays with tragic history and it represents a threat to national mental health as well. TV news is drift, drifting further into showbiz. TV, movies, and plays are increasingly going to the docudrama. The ordeals are terrible. Journalism and escapism aren't just cross-pollinating in television. They are cross-polluting. At least the creators of the Washington Behind Closed Doors had an imposing point to make with their fictionalized story. They said it was fiction. But ABC bragged about the Oswald show as historical fact 
and not speculation, and Lawrence Schiller was criticized for inaccuracies in restaging the assassination. Lawrence Schiller they referred to as a Dino de Laurentiis of the graveyard. He's also the showman who brought the rights to Gary Gilmore's life before Gilmore's execution. He goes beyond everyday vulgarity with Oswald. That's from the Washington Post. The Salt Lake Tribune said that the Lee Harvey Oswald story, the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald, um, is roasting the networks that they will be charged with exploiting the Kennedy assassination and parading a string of misconceptions in front of the television audience. One Miami critic accused ABC of treating history like a harlot and concluded that the whole business is a sleazy exercise in insinuation and innuendo, innuendo using hindsight to devious advantage. There is an obligation to clearly state what facts are known and label them as that, as fact. But when ABC allows its reviewers to absorb docudrama as if it were truth, the network lends the power of television to a monstrous misconception which can only distort the tragedy even more. That's Harold Schindler, the Salt Lake Tribune. The New York Times had an article, Oswald, as imagined by ABC TV. They said tens of millions of viewers were asked to mail in ballots to Good Morning America. The wiles of marketing strategists recognize no bounds. Putting the verdict aside, we're left with the extraordinary, clever, and disturbing, mi disturbing mixture of incontrovertible fact, feasible conjecture, unsubstantiated rumor, and outright distortion. Much of the evidence that was recovered was stated since Watergate. It says, the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald is not a terribly subtle polemic masquerading as an exercise in objective justice. Richard Freed, the producer, has been trying to sell his project since 1965, and now the public was willing to re-examine the issues. In effect, Vietnam and Watergate have made compulsive skeptics of us all. That in itself may not be bad, but it need not make us uncritically gullible consumers of the worst that can be imagined. This is from the New York Times. The television film was bad. The audience may vote as it wants, but the question of Lee Harvey Oswald has only been exploited and not answered. Television, with its programming mix of electronic journalism and popular entertainment, has a special obligation to distinguish clearly between fact and fiction. The medium cannot afford to indulge ambivalently in what-if hypotheses. They mislead and they confuse. Now, those are three reviews. I take ten papers a day. I don't have to read them all to you. When you see the Washington Post, the Salt Lake Tribune, and the New York Times giving these kind of reviews of a national TV show, you can imagine that there is a growing awareness around the country on this subject. As I say, CBS is coming out with a show in November called Ruby and Oswald. Their conclusion is that Oswald, the R.B. Oswald, killed John Kennedy, and it was an irrational act, and Jack Ruby killed Lee Harvey Oswald, and that was an irrational act. And they've sent out a press release saying that their movie, Ruby and Oswald, may help to end a lot of speculation about the JFK assassination. No one ever had the advantage of seeing the whole story in one package. There won't be any more of this conjecture. This is from Mel Stewart, who's putting together the CBS show, which you can believe will be one more line of conjecture. Uh, going into some points about the ABC show, to be specific, uh, they began by saying that the pictures that they were filming were the actual locations where the events took place. Well, that's only partly true. The picture that they showed was the famous Abraham Zabruder film on the side of the Texas School Book Depository. They didn't show any of the film across the street of the Umbrella Man or the Dow Tex building or where the crimes were committed. They took generalizations such as uh, Oswald's mental state. They said Oswald appears to be an enigma to his family and acquaintances, his psychiatrists or experts or even to himself. This was on national television. But they never went into this Colonel Lawrence Orloff or George Morinchild, who acquainted him with Marina Oswald and were deep into intelligence for the past 30 years. They didn't go into Michael Payne, the man whose home Lee Harvey Oswald visited, and Marina Oswald stayed there with his security clearance working for Walter Dornberger, a Nazi war criminal. 
They didn't go into the uh, testimony of Max Clark, the chief of security of Convair at General Dynamics, who was the first person Lee Harvey Oswald saw when he came home from the Soviet Union. They didn't go the, into the fact that Albert Jenner, one of the attorneys for the Warren Commission, is a lawyer for General Dynamics. They didn't go into the fact that General Dynamics made the airplanes for Howard Hughes, and Howard Hughes was the umbrella of these assassination teams with his agent, Robert Mayhew, contacting the assassination teams. Nor did ABC mention Jean de Morinchild being brought to the United States by Howard Hughes because her brother worked for him and another brother worked for the CIA. They left out Galley Clark with her contacts, a royalty, czar's royalty in Russia, and Marina Oswald's family that were more linked to the czar's family than they were to the Comasol or the KGB. The CBS and the ABC programs glide over Lee R. V. Oswald. We'll talk about ABC specifically again. They have uh, blanket statements such as he joined the Marines at 17, and immediately after being discharged, he renounced his American citizenship and ends up in the Soviet Union. The next sentence was he was refused Soviet citizenship and wasn't permitted to stay in the Soviet Union. He attempted to commit suicide. I tape recorded the show. Uh, we'll go back to those three sentences. They say he joined the Marines at 17 and then jumped to when he was discharged. They don't go into his assignment at the Itsugi Air Base where the U-2s were directed. They don't go into his uh, involvement in the Philippines with the U-2 uh, operations down the Philippines or his security clearances in the service, his receiving money from plain clothesmen on duty, the conditions of his discharge. They simply say he was discharged and ended up in Russia. They don't go into the fact that he learned Russian language and was tested while in the Marines, and everyone who knew him believed that he was working more with the government as an agent people that were interviewed than he ever was a leftist. Uh, Gary Powers claimed that he had a role in downing the U-2, and they don't go into that at all. They didn't bring in, in the ABC show when he arrived in Russia and was refused to stay in the Soviet Union for the first time. The fact that his first contact there was CIA agent Richard Snyder, described in Who's Who in the CIA, in the Soviet Embassy. His next contact, the same office, was CIA agent John McVicker, written up his biography in Who's Who in the CIA. Then at the hotel room, he was met by Priscilla Johnson, a confirmed CIA writer who was in the Soviet Union, who now co-authored a book with Marina Oswald. He ended up with Aline Mosley, a CIA correspondent in the Soviet Union before he went to Minsk. They didn't bring out that the suicide story was faked or the diary was faked or how he left his passport at the embassy, and then it was ready for him when he wanted to come home. They also uh, showed a scene of Marina Oswald and Lee at a party having a drink, and he asked her to dance, and it was very sociable. And uh, they have a toast, and the next thing you know, they're all back in the Fort Worth, Dallas area. They don't tell you the chronology of Lee Harvey Oswald in the movie on a chart so you can study it, how he met Marina Oswald at a meeting, March 17, 1961. He saw her again March 24, 1961, at a public meeting, and they were engaged and married 44 days later. The engagement took place in a hospital where he stayed 10 days, and Marina Oswald was a pharmacist. Um, the important chronology of Lee Harvey Oswald and the Soviet Union was left out of the ABC show. January the 7th, 1960, he was assigned to a Minsk radio factory where Alexander Zeiger from Argentine was uh, running this factory. May 1960, five months later, Gary Powers was down and claimed that Lee Harvey Oswald had a role in bringing the U-2 down. February 1961, Lee Harvey Oswald was ready to return back to the United States after the peace conferences were broken and Gary Powers was brought down. On March 17, 1961, one month after he asked to return to the United States, he meets Marina uh, at this public meeting. And it wasn't a dance social. It was a public meeting. Uh, Ted Gandolfo in New York has a document that Lee Harvey Oswald went to the Soviet Union for the purpose of bringing uh, this woman back to the United States. And the very first date that Lee had with Marina in the company of other people, he was at the home of a person or persons who had just come back from the United States, and ABC doesn't tell you who that family was. And on July 10th, uh, 1961, a few months after he met Marina, this was in March, 
Um, he meets Marina in July the 10th. He has his passport, and the American embassy is ready to give him the money to come home. June the 4th, 1962, uh, Marina and Lee Oswald depart for the United States. They're immediately met by the white Russian community, the Solidaris, the Greek Orthodox Church members who were a conduit of CIA funds. They were met by the International Rescue Committee, which was a violently anti-communist organization. They were taken to their hotel in New York. They didn't have to go through customs. And uh, they were taken to the airport and flown to the Fort Worth area. The story that Oswald was rejected and didn't have friends certainly doesn't hold up based on the chronology of Lee Harvey Oswald, of how he got everything he wanted. He left his passport at the embassy. He picked it up and uh, got his money to come home, brought a wife home, and ended up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. There also is a nice little line in the movie uh, where they say to Marina Oswald, this ABC movie, uh, now you're not allowed under Texas law to testify at the trial of your husband. Uh, that clears them for all that follows because the very first witness at the Warren Commission, which would have been like a trial if Lee Harvey Oswald had lived, was none other than Marina Oswald, the wife. She made at least 40 lies to the FBI and the investigators in the course of her public testimony under oath. She was the first person to say, I know my husband is guilty, and nail him. She lied about his being fired on a job from Leslie Welding, knowing that he resigned and had a job placed for him in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. She lied about the attempt to shoot General Walker. She has lied about the attempt to shoot Richard Nixon. He was nowhere near where Lee Harvey Oswald and Marina were when she tells this story. She uh, lied about the name Alex Hydale that she actually signed for Fair Play for Cuba Committee, and the gun was ordered under that name, and Lee Oswald said if the rifle was ordered, Marina received it. I didn't receive it. She fabricated about, as I say, his rifle, his unemployment, his habits, his aliases, and she was used by Earl Warren and the Warren Commission down the line to set a profile of a no-good bum that could be discredited and set the motives uh, for the assassination in her relationship with him. And, of course, the ABC movie lied about his jobs, his employment facility. There's a line in the movie where they said Oswald held many jobs. A few weeks before the assassination, he got himself employed in the Texas School Book Depository. He didn't get himself employed. George de Morinchild, an agent with the CIA for 20 years, introduced Lee and Marina to Ruth Payne, and Ruth Payne called Roy Truly, and they immediately put Lee Harvey Oswald on the payroll the next day. Uh, George de Morinchild got him a job at Jagger's Chili Stove, which printed maps of Cuba, government bonds. You need a security clearance. He worked with a gentleman there who had been a spy out here at Monterey, had learned Russian, Mr. Ofstein. He worked with people that were extremely right-wing with government clearances. And at Riley Coffee Company in New Orleans, the man who owned Raleigh was funded by the CIA through the Mullen Associates in Washington, D.C., ran the Free Cuban Committee. Mr. Riley belonged to the extreme anti-Castro organizations, and Lee Harvey Oswald picked up his paychecks there. He didn't actually work at Riley. I could go through the ABC television series word for word uh, errors. As I say, I tape recorded and I wrote about 40 pages of errors in their four-hour movie. And I know that the subjects I brought up now, uh, if you have the tapes, as I say, of these shows, you can say ditto to the CBS show. Um, these national television shows just are total rip-offs. They are mind pollution. I've said for a long time that the news media on ABC, NBC, and CBS is mind pollution, and that's what it is. Well, 30 minutes is up. We're used to 45, so i got to run along pretty fast. We'll call it quiz for tonight. I'll see you next Sunday on Dialogue Conspiracy. I hope my friends and witnesses stay well, and you keep well. And we'll see you next week on Dialogue Conspiracy. This is Mae Brussel. You've been listening to Dialogue Conspiracy with Mae Brussel.